Well, my mum reckons that when I was four that I told her that I was going to be a doctor because I went to the doctors, I think, to get one of the injections or something that you get when you're that age. And I apparently said to her then that I was going to be a doctor, but I don't remember that. I remember wanting to drive the lift at Myers because there was this really cool sort of lever that they pulled and I thought that would be a really great job. I'm Wendy Brown. I'm a general surgeon who specialises in surgery of the stomach and the esophagus. And I'm the professor and director of surgery at Alfred Health. I remember around, I guess it'd be around grade eight, grade nine, and we, we, we went to church and they had um, a missionary couple come and show slides, because that's how old I am, it wasn't PowerPoint, it was slides, um, of their trip to Africa and how they'd helped all these people in Africa. And in those days, there was still leprosy and all these other diseases. And I just thought, wow, wouldn't that be amazing to be able to help people? I'm the first generation of my family to go to university. Um, my dad, was in sales and marketing and my mum um, was a legal secretary and my grandparents sort of lived up the road here in Paran and worked at Paran Market and at Palaco. And so it was a kind of a strange thing in my family when I declared I wanted to be a doctor, <laughs> but they were very encouraging and supportive. I thought I'd be a GP or an obstetrician. Um, that was kind of my two things that I really loved at medical school. and. In my final year, just before I sat my final exams, I had a big bust up with a boy, which is, I suppose, what happens, but it was six weeks before my final medical exams. And I was kind of, in some ways, it kind of focused me and I ended up getting a really good result in my final year exams. And um, I ended up coming to the Alfred and I was still thinking, oh, I'm gonna do obstetrics probably. But my first rotation was Caulfield and my second rotation was Maui and then my third rotation was general surgery at the Alfred. And it's really funny, um, I think I'd decided, because in Maui, which is a country town in Victoria, I'd covered obstetrics there and I'd decided that it wasn't quite as glamorous in, as I thought it was as a medical student. And so I'd sort of gone off obstetrics a bit. And I still remember I was doing some photocopying um, at the photocopier and Professor O'Brien, who was the professor of surgery at that stage, he sort of came up to me and said, oh, what are you thinking about doing? And I said, oh, I really don't know. I had thought obstetrics, but I've sort of changed my mind. And he said, well, I really think you should do surgery. And then that same week, Professor Masterton, who was the head of the Burns unit, who I was working with, he sort of took me aside and said, I really think you should think about doing surgery. And then that same week, um, as an intern in those days, you used to get to assist a little bit in surgery. And I was assisting one of my tutors when I'd gone through med school and I really admired. And um, I was having to take off a skin lesion and it took me about seven strokes to get through the skin because I was so anxious about you know, hurting the patient. And after it took about an hour to take out this skin lesion, I looked at him and said, oh, Mr. Woods, don't worry, I don't want to be a surgeon. And he said, but I really think you should be. And so suddenly I started to think, well, maybe I could do surgery. And so I started to take a bit more notice and go to the operations. And I thought some of the operations were the cleverest things I'd ever seen. Like when I did cardiothoracics, I just thought that was so clever how they could sew the vessels in. It reminded me of how Nana taught me to put sleeves into um, a shirt. There was something that was very appealing about we fixed people, you know, people came in with a problem and we fixed it. So someone came in with appendicitis, you took out their appendix, two days later they went home really healthy and happy. People came in with a breast cancer, we cut out the breast cancer, they went home happy and healthy. And that was a bit more immediate than some of the other jobs I'd done, like medicine where, you know, you start some furizamide, start some digoxin, do a bit of this, do a bit of this and have to wait. You didn't get that quite so immediate sort of satisfaction of fixing someone. And maybe that went back to the 13 year old me, you know, I want to help people, I want to fix people, you know, so um, it was never on the cards and I'm still a little bit surprised I became a surgeon, um, but I'm really glad that those people took the time to encourage me and encourage me to think about it. Was there any time where you thought, oh, I should have, should have done something else, I should have manned the, the lifts at my <laughs> I think lots of times. As an intern, I still remember my first day thinking, what have I done to myself? This is the biggest mistake of my life. Like, it's terribly scary and I'm suddenly responsible for all these people and I have to work all these hours. Particularly when things don't go the way you want them to for your patient, when the patient doesn't get the outcome that you'd hoped for, you, you still even now lie in bed at night thinking, is this really what I want to do with my life? Surely there's something else I could do. But then you get through that again and you remember what a great privilege that you have. Like I, it's such a privileged job. I get to meet people at their most vulnerable 
and I get to help be part of their journey, um, you know, towards healing or in some of my cancer patients, unfortunately, you know, for them it's not towards healing, it's towards end of life. Um, but they're still healing sometimes in that journey. So um, every time I think, you know, I've made a huge mistake, I think back and think about all the amazing people I've met and the experiences that I've been fortunate enough to have as part of that. There's been a few patients that have had massive impact. One in particular I always think of was a gentleman and it was my first shift on call as a consultant back here at the Alfred. So I'd done all my training, I'd done a PhD, I'd gone away and done a fellow year in Brisbane, I'd been overseas and I'd come back and my very first shift was this young man who was about 32 and he got one of the flesh-eating bacterias and he was a um, a truck driver from Adelaide and they were actually on their way driving to Melbourne for his brother's wedding and his wife was very heavily pregnant with their fourth child and um, anyway he ended up needing to have legs cut off and limbs cut off and we, we just couldn't get ahead of the infection and I had to go and talk to his wife and say you know unfortunately you know I don't think he's going to make it and it was a really awful conversation she was very pregnant you know, the family were all expecting to be at a wedding that day, not at the hospital. Um, they were crying, I was crying, and I just thought, I can't do, th that's one of the moments where I just thought, I don't think I can do this, I can't take this kind of responsibility on. After that, I actually went and got a psychologist, like this is in the early 2000s, and, and I did some debriefing for a few weeks because it really was upsetting me. And then I got the most beautiful letter from his wife, and she said to me, that it really meant a lot to her that I'd cried with them because I'd been going to see the psychologist because I thought there was something wrong with me that I couldn't help myself because I was crying when I was talking to this family and she said it just really made me realise that even though you couldn't help my husband um, that the person who looked after him really cared and she said that just meant so much to us all and so that really stuck with me. I spent you know a lot of time trying to be really you know, we were told, you know, you have to keep clinical distance, make sure that you don't show your emotion. But now I kind of, I guess that affected me because now I don't feel so afraid to let people see that I feel it with them. And I think that's really changed my practice for the better. I started as a surgical registrar, so that's the first level of training in 1996. And even then at the Alfred, 20% of the general surgical registrars were women. Um, at that time in Australia it was less than 5%, but we had some really amazing senior males. There weren't any female consultants at that stage, but there was um, you know, some real legendary surgeons that were all really proactive about encouraging anyone who was bright. It didn't matter you know, if you were female, male, you know, if you came from the right school, the wrong school, they just really were all about encouraging the brightest and the best to do surgery because surgery was where it was at. And they made you believe that you could do it. And without that sort of support, A, I don't think I ever would have thought about it. And secondly, like I think just sometimes when you have those bad days and doubt yourself, you could always go back to what those guys had said to you about, yeah, of course you can do it, that'd be great, you'll be fine. My mum used to always say, because I had red hair when I was growing up, and I used to have freckles and I was a bit chubby and mum used to say, well, if they don't like you, and we, we moved a fair bit with my dad's job and she said, oh, if they don't like you now, don't worry, they'll like you one day. And so maybe there's just this inbuilt optimism I have that even if something's not quite what you want it to be right now, eventually it will be. I think there's been challenges, but every challenge in the end, when I look back on it, has brought more reward than heartache. At times, I think when I, after that particular incident, I really wasn't sleeping and I was really anxious and it was really stressful being a new consultant because I felt like the weight of the world was on my shoulders. And so part of getting through that was recognising that there's always colleagues around you who can help you and you just need to ask. Debriefing is really important, you know. It might be just as simple as going, we, you know, going to the pub or to a restaurant and having a drink and chatting and just sort of normalising life. Um, but it, sometimes it can be, I still ring my mentors, you know, from 20 years ago occasionally and just say, has this ever happened to you? And it's always reassuring to hear that they usually say, yes, it has. And then they tell you about five other stories that make you contextualise and make things back into place. So I think it's about recognising sometimes it's the patient's journeys, not yours. 
I think also having a life outside of medicine is great too. You know, there's been periods in my life, particularly when I was a registrar, where one of my jobs we were doing 180 hour fortnights. So I really didn't do anything other than work. You know, I worked and slept, worked and slept, and I was tired and cranky. I put on weight. I didn't exercise and I really didn't like myself as a person and I could hear myself talking on the phone to people and thinking just this isn't me and who I want to be and so I think it's really important to luckily we don't demand those sort of hours off people anymore um, and nor should we but even when it's really busy to find time to go for a walk go for a run um, seek out something that makes you joyful. I'd like to be able to say I play golf, but I'm not very good. I've been trying. And I'm also really interested in art. So my husband collects art pretty seriously. And so since I met him, I've become more and more interested in contemporary art in particular. And so really enjoy going off to galleries and museums and expanding that side of my brain because I feel like at work, I'm pretty much totally using the other side of my brain. <laughs> Gosh, that's a harder question. <laughs> um, I was really proud when I finished my PhD and I was also really proud when I finished my surgical training. That was to get, a, you know, the final exams for surgery um, is a pretty gruelling thing. You do two written papers and there's five orals. We used to have to go and get our results on the steps of the College of Surgeons. So you're standing outside the, the College of Surgeons and you get an envelope that says pass or fail. But that feeling of achieved achieving it and becoming a surgeon and then when the Alfred rang and offered me an academic position and it was kind of what I'd always wanted that was a really proud moment too where I just thought wow you know I finally you know this is I'm getting to work at the Alfred this is what I want. Why it's important to have women as, as surgeons or also within those director roles? Look I think what we want at the end of the day is good surgeons and we want people who are good surgeons, who are good technically, but also are good at managing the patient and communicating and teaching and all of the other sort of competencies that come with being a rounded surgeon. And it would be, if we didn't have women in surgery, then we wouldn't be representing our community. You know, our community's not just men, our community's men and women. And having women as well represented as men in surgery means that we reflect the community we serve. So I think it's really important that women should see surgery as a viable option, that it is a career that they can fit in around anything else it is that they want to do in their lives. And that they don't have to have that experience like I had where you're working 180 hour fortnights and you have to move all the time and your personal life takes a bit of a battering. It doesn't have to be like that. There's other ways to train, there's other ways to tackle things and I think there's a greater acceptance now that we need people to have lives outside of work um, so that people shouldn't be put off um, by, I often hear from young women, oh look, I, I'd like to do surgery, I love surgery, but I'm worried that it's you know, gonna be too much time and that I won't be able to have a family and all these different things. Um, I would say any specialty that you do, any, if you decide to be a specialist doctor, you're gonna have to commit four years or five years of your life to really investing in your craft. Um, and there will be some sacrifices you're going to have to make, but we're much better these days at not making it a total sacrifice. Why do you do what you do? Because I love it. Um, because I really do, even when I have a bad day, I know that I have a really privileged job. I feel incredibly fortunate that I've had the opportunities I've had and I feel I owe the community a great debt of gratitude and so that's one of the reasons that I continue to work in the public sector because I had grandparents that would never have been able to have private insurance and I think it's really a privilege that I get to work in an environment where I get to deal with some really interesting people with amazing um, challenges I suppose, surgical challenges um, and I get to sort of pay back maybe a little bit to the community that's allowed me to have such an amazing opportunity um, to do a job that is so interesting. It sort of challenges me mentally, physically, technically, emotionally, spiritually every day. And I don't think there's many people that can say that they go to work and have that experience. So I feel very fortunate. <laughs>